Yeah. Well, no, really. What took so long to get to you? I wanted, I've always wanted to get you on the show. Oh, yeah. Well, that like makes the show big enough that. for you. Yeah. We had to grow the show. And then the show... No, it's big enough for me to be on it. Yeah, yes. I like that. No, yes. no, no, no. Hey, you have a, you have a Let's, I mean, we... we start start. Come on, Donnie, I'm going with that. Wait a minute. Yeah. We, there technically is cameras rolling right now, so it right. is technically on the show. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, what took us so long to get to Sam? We got to Sam before we got to Todd Summers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Saying, right. That feels that's good. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get serious. Uh, okay. Sorry, sorry, Tyler Wally, if you're out there. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching. Hey, this isn't live, right? Tell me it's not. Yeah. No, it's not live. Not okay, live. cool. No, it's no. not live. No, it's not no. live. But we try We try not to edit anything out. But like this said, will probably be on the show. <laughs> yeah, most likely. And, and fans of the Toddy Wally <laughs> <laughs> Todd will be on the show. Yeah. Todd yes. is as, he sh as he should be. Todd yes. is committed to the show. So yeah. we, 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 we love Toddy Waddy. We do love Todd. <laughs> we love Toddy Waddy. Yeah. I've seen him up on multiple episodes. Uh, He's been mentioned quite often by Gunny. Yeah. When we do Todd, we're going to have a, Gunny's going to be, he's going to have, Joe's got a shock collar. <laughs> For a dog. For his yeah. dog. Yeah. And we're going to have it around um, Gunny. Over there. <laughs> and I'm going to have the buzzer right here. Good yeah. good call. It. i got to keep things under control. Yeah. They, it's like they can read when I'm about to say something mean. They can just hit that buzzer. Yeah. I don't even have to be mid-sentence. Uh, just going to know. All right. Are we okay. ready? No. Yeah. We're not ready. <clears throat> Dude. Get this on camera. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, fucking disgusting. COVID. Yeah, COVID blowing his nose over there. He's a pig. He always is doing that. Yeah, but you know what? You guys have noticed we're not social distancing anymore. Like y'all were all weirded out on episode one. Hey, you guys, we need to separate. We need to social distance. We. I, I mean, like March, I'm though. still social distancing. What the hell are you talking about? You're really close to Joe. I've always been close to Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, I mean, let's start. Only, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah. On camera. You Joe guys and I. Live. <laughs> Let's have just been in proximity near each other <laughs> geographically. Yes, so, geographically. So, 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 <laughs> yeah, and welcome yeah. to this week's show. Venti Seis! <laughs> no, it's Venti Siete. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Venti yeah. Siete. Anyway, okay, ready? Yes. Here we go, back with episode 27. Venti Siete. Venti Seis? No, Venti Oh, screw yeah. that up. Yeah. As always, we have Gunny Matheson. Grow the show. Joe Schmidt. And I'm super excited tonight to have Sam Smith. We've wanted to have him for a long time, but we had to make sure the show reached a certain stature Perfect. before we got Sam on the show. So, but... But now... But now our show is going to go diabolic because Sam is here. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the plan. That's that meant. was the plan. It's going to go crazy. It's going to go crazy. I know I'm super excited to have Sam because I know Sam has a lot of stuff. I know the show's big, Tom, because I actually have seen it on Facebook. That's oh, big that's pretty is. big. Yeah. That is huge, right? Yeah. Now, do you, I mean, get, do you get Facebook on your oh, flip phone? Oh, yeah. Oh, on yeah. the flip you'd, phone. You'd be surprised what you that have flip a, phone You still no. have the flip phone. You went from... You, you went iPhone phone, and then you went back, and right? Then you went iPhone. I actually went back, yeah. And yeah. Back. It just works Dude, for me. Sam's phone huh. is so old, it's not even 3G, and they got 5G. <laughs> right Sam just has cell phone. <laughs> cell phone, yeah, just cell phone. But what would make you go from what would make you go from iPhone to flip phone? You know, I I mean, flip I phone actually to iPhone found it really hard to text while I was driving on the on the iPhone. Yeah. But you can just talk but, to it. Yeah, I know, but I never really figured out how to do that part. <laughs> <laughs> so it's easier to text on a flip phone while you're driving. Oh yeah, a lot easier. Yeah. Don't you have to hit every <laughs> number like beep beep? Be, like if you want yeah, to get but a you C, get, you gotta hit it. Three you get times. really good at it after a while, Tom. None of that yeah. sounds very safe. But anyway, let's move on to another topic. What do you say? <laughs> Shit. Huh? I like this topic. Yeah, because <laughs> everyone's going flip phone. What the <laughs> Sam Smith? What the fuck? So to get a flip phone, did you have to go like a? It's a special I order. I, I really don't think you can get yeah, it anymore. You, I, I gotta just tell you. He's got a guy. Do you have to go to Salvation Army. To get a flip <laughs> yeah. Phone? Yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. There's a box. Well. 
Actually, the last time I got one, and it's been a while, I'm going to tell you, but uh, the guy said you can go online and get them off, you know, aftermarket for $100. No, that's black market. <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> I took a $100 bill out. I put it on the counter. I said, call me when you got it. Yeah. Nice. That's yeah. ballsy. <laughs> no, so. no, no, that's not ballsy. That's gangster, right? That's gangster. That's OG, that's, right? That's, yeah. yeah, so how about that? And, yeah. oh, and Sam, whenever I worked for Tom, I've seen it, like the last flip phone he had. He got so mad at it ringing all day. He took it out of his pocket and he chunked it into the grass about 100 feet. And then he loped two circles. And he said to the other guy that worked for us, you might know him. Hey, Schwartzy, go find my phone. <laughs> yeah, I think I do know it. <laughs> Not only does he know it, I think... He works for me because of Sam. Yeah, probably. I think Sam is the one that set that all up with Pat Schwartz. I think that's hmm. right. Yeah, and that was, thank you, because that, you know, Pat is a good guy, and he entertained the shit out of us. Oh, we, yeah. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. He still calls and we still talk. So. Still entertaining. Every time yep. I run into Pat, I'm, I am entertained, I have to tell you. But I, I think I am almost certain you made that first phone call. I think you're right. Yep. Well, I mean, y'all were talking about somebody, and I was talking about Tom chunking his flip phone and said, Patsy to get it. I, I, I like I like the fact that you threw your phone in the field and made somebody else go get it. <laughs> More than I like talking about Pat. But, <laughs> <laughs> not to the Well, fact. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. Yeah. We're not talking about you anymore. Yeah. I didn't mean to go there, Pat. But yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. times. We had some good times back then. But anyway, so back to Sam because he is our guest today. Yeah, we yeah. Ask yeah. yeah right. we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll get back. So, <clears throat> Sam, you and I, I think we probably met in maybe 1980. Does five sound right at the Derby in Minnesota? At the Derby in Minnesota. I'm not good at the years. I remember seeing you there. I didn't know who you were, but. I see a dude riding around with a broken leg on a sorrow horse, long blonde hair growing down his back. Didn't have any on his head, he just had it growing down his back. But uh, I asked somebody, who's, who's the young guy with, the, with his leg in the cast? I said, well, that's Tom McCutcheon. So that's my first memory oh, yeah. of you. You yeah. saw a horse show with a broken leg? Well, I think you got it of, there. Yeah, the story of that is I didn't go there with that. I was, And back in those days, there was no structured riding. Everybody did whatever, There was whenever, no structure in anything. anything. No, nothing. Yeah, it was so great. I was loping one way. I was loping <laughs> to the left on one end. And who had... There was a non-pro that had a little black mare that was winning everything back then. Would have been um, uh, Joel Cohen? Joel Cohen. That's yeah. who it was. So Joe Cohen's loping around the other way on the other end. And, of course, our horses weren't as broke then as we think they are now. And my horse kind of leaned across the middle, and his kind of leaned across the middle. And my knee hit his horse's hip and dislocated my knee. And, uh, yeah, so that's how that all went down. And that was, that was a long story. but And, actually, uh, don't, well, it wouldn't have been that year. It might have been the year after that that... Uh, no, that's not where it was born either. I was trying to think of some things that were significant to the Derby being up there, and that would be more like it's the first time we ever saw freestyle raining. Yes. It's the first time we ever saw uh, paid warm-ups. Oh, uh, wow. Was yeah. at, the, at the Derby. Yeah, what, for what, sure. What a bad idea that turned into, huh? Yeah. <laughs> paid warm-ups everywhere now, huh? Yeah, and, and it, you know, the paid warm-ups, the freestyle raining, the, the novice horse class, there, the divisions yep. started. I mean, all of that started. And, you know, Colleen started. Colleen McQuay started all of that stuff yep. through that raining. And, it, you know, I mean, it, so much at that horse show we see now in the business. And yep. it, was a, it was a big deal. But I remember that. I mean, that was, we still go there once in a while to show. And that was, that was just a, the memories at that place. It was only there for, what, like three years? Yeah, not very long. It had been... Uh... It had been in Raleigh, uh, and then it moved up there for just uh, probably three years, something like that, and then it moved to Oklahoma City. Who were you working for then? Uh, I was working for BH. You were Bill. still working for BH? Yeah. And how long did you work for BH? When did you start? 
Uh, you know, I must have been about 25, 26 years old. Uh, I actually rode horses for Bill for three years, and then uh, I was actually at his place for four years. The fourth year that I was there, I had won the limited open world title the last year I rode horses for him. Uh, and, and I had done some things prior to that. Uh, had some some success uh, in the horse business and, and in reining in particular, and uh, wanted to go out on my own. Uh, prior to prior to winning the world title, or prior to going oh to yeah, long before Bill? that, yeah. So before you went to Bill, you you'd been showing range. Yeah. So how did you get involved? Was your horse was your family involved? Well, I, I was raised on a dairy farm in Indiana, and I got a horse when I was like nine years old. And I was just going to ride around the farm a little bit. And I went to a horse show after I had him for two or three weeks. I didn't know anything. But I saw a guy riding around at, a, at this local show. And I could tell that he was just way better than everybody else there. And I asked somebody, you know, why, how, how is it that he's so good? They said, he's a horse trainer. <laughs> and I said, what? They said, yeah, he trains horses. He rides horses all day long. And I was, I'm raised on a dairy farm. Okay, I mean, <laughs> figure it out. Yeah. Uh, I was riding horses when I was nine years old. I knew I was going to be a horse trainer. Yeah, mm -hmm. the, I, ne I never <clears throat> thought about anything other than that. Yeah, if you were raised on a dairy farm, yeah, that's where you learned how to put in long hours. Yeah, and work. No, I learned it training horses. <laughs> <laughs> dairy farm is a lot easier than training horses. <laughs> If that messes up the story, oh, well, <laughs> man. Now, well, I grew up in Wisconsin, and I, I mean, I know the dairy farm business a little bit, and uh, I mean, I never, I, I worked for a couple of days here and there at one, but, you know, those guys are just married to the Yeah, to you are. Place. The one thing I can remember as a young kid growing up, and and I was lucky because my dad farmed with his brother, and and. I helped them when I did because I wanted to. I wasn't ever really forced on me. Uh, but I can remember a hot summer day, he decided he was going to sell all his soybeans and they're loading out a grain bin. And I mean, it's pretty easy. Uh, they got an auger in the grain bin. It's taking them up, putting them in the truck until pretty soon that starts, thing starts rattling. The beans aren't going in the auger anymore. So the only way to get them in there, you go in that grain bin with shovels and shovel them into that grain bin. And it's about 120 degrees in there. <laughs> and I was about 12 and I'm in there helping my dad. And, and, and finally I asked him, I said, how come we got to do this? And he just looked at me and he said, cause it's got to be done. Yeah. And it wasn't any more complicated than that. And there's been a lot of times in my life I was doing something that maybe I'd rather be doing something else. And I could hear his voice say that. You know, you, huh. I'm going to tell you, your dad was, I, I don't know your dad, and I haven't heard any stories about your dad before from you, but I can tell you your dad was a big influence on you, because you and I had a conversation one day, and we were talking about somebody, and I don't remember who, but I said, you know... That's not nice, by the way, talking, <laughs> talking about somebody, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know who it was, but <laughs> we were saying, you know, and I was saying to you... Yeah, you know, I mean, that guy, he's hes a little different, huh? He's, he just seems to me like he's a little different. And you said, well, if we were all the same, that would be kind of odd, wouldn't it? That's <laughs> like, it just hit me like, well, that makes sense. Yeah, we, yeah. we can't yeah. all be the same. That would be yeah. good. Like real food or, real, or fake food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's funny how, you know, you hear something... From different people, I can tell. I can remember you telling me something one time. We were talking about. I can. I can remember several things, but one of them's being at the legacy sale, and you saying, "You know, there's probably several fraternity winners here today that's going to sell. If you just knew which one he was." Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. That that and you told me what an open horse was one time, and. I I get it. I got it then. I I get it. You tell me that's a that's a horse that you can make a couple mistakes on showing and still mark a seventy four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know none of us get a whole lot of those. Some of us get more than others. But I I know I know what that horse is like. You know. So, yeah. 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 No. No. Those are rare. But I and I've always 
That I've always that's always been the intrigue for me going to any of those sales, whether it be the legacy sale or the fraternity sale. You know there's a couple of stars in there. Oh yeah. You just you have no idea which one. And yep. ne- you know, really neither do they at that point. And it may be the one that it may be the one that costs forty thousand or it may be the one that costs, you know, seven thousand. Those horses don't know what they cost. No, it's just no. as likely to be either one. <laughs> yeah. You know? Little Joe Cash was seven thousand seven hundred dollars at the legacy season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And turned out to be a superstar. I I mean, I wanted to buy a little Joe Cash as a two year old. I went to look at him. And they, he priced him to me for a lot of money. And I went over to look at him. And when I got there, which was right across the street from me, they, are, they, cha- they, they said, he's not for sale. And that was probably the best move that... Uh, Takes you a long time to get across the road, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I got there... <laughs> yeah, I, rode, was, I rode my bicycle. <laughs> it was three and a half weeks, but I meant to be there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, I got over there pretty quick because I, I liked that horse and, and uh, Russell. I, I don't know. I don't know. Somebody's wires were crossed somewhere. I, I don't know. And, that, ain't and really, I, that ain't really fair, but that's a whole different subject. And, and I was fine with it. I mean, I was absolutely, I mean, that, it was a nice horse, and, and uh, that was a great move on Russell's part to keep that horse, and yeah. he's turned out to be a superstar and a superstar sire. And He's one of those once-in-a-lifetime horses, so she yeah. was, it was a smart move to keep him. So I just, you know, I wouldn't have minded if he would have been my once-in-a-lifetime horse. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I feel like I had the once-in-a-lifetime horse with uh, Gunner Special Night, but I, I mean, I, don't, I got him way late, yep. you know. But uh, those horses are rare. I mean, there's, there's a few guys that run into a lot of those, but there's a lot of guys that, you know, look their whole life for those kind of, of rare horses. And, you know, you'll go to those horse sales, and, and, you know, you've bought them, I've bought them, we've all bought horses at those horse sales, and there's, you know, a couple that cost half of what we give for the ones we bought that turned out to be superstars. And you're like, mm, why didn't I buy that one, yeah. Yeah. you know? And I was there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was there, and I, and I saw it walk through the ring, you know? Why didn't I buy that one? But, you know, it's, that's, that's what, to me, that's what makes it all so much fun. Oh, yeah. It, you know, you, know if, you would never go to the casino if you lost every time. You know the opportunity is there to win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? and, and you know why it's so hard to recognize those horses when you're at the sale because the most important part of them is inside them. You can't hundred percent. Yeah. It's inside. Hundred percent. Could not agree more. Because those good ones, they come all they come in all different shapes and, and sizes. We have, you know, different. Uh, body styles we like whatever uh you need you know you want those good sound legs and everything and then and then here comes uh, one that's you know just totally the, the opposite but yeah. yep yeah a hundred percent and then he's the and that's the best one i mean he doesn't x-ray perfect and he's not everything that you want and the thing is i always say when we watch him lope around in the round pen it gives us an idea yep but we change all of that so much anyway. By the time we get on them and start pulling on their face and moving their hip, and I mean, all of that stuff changes so much anyway that they kind of fall into a mode, mold. So whoever's, you know, whoever's riding them, they fall into that mode if they're the right kind. So mm-hmm. we, uh, we kind of got off track again, you guys. I mean, oh, we're, oh, we're going like down this road. We like them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's where and we then, go is off track. Yeah, but then you That's went right. way down that road off track. And we were yeah. talking about Sam when he was nine years old. Well, no, we were at 12. You can't was, really blame me, though, because this is my first time here, so I don't really yeah. know no, yeah. how blame, this goes. I'm not blaming you. I'm okay, looking good. through you down to the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were sh- so you were shoveling soybeans. Yeah, and then, yeah. then what no, happened no, after he, that? He had a that. horse. He was shoveling. And he, he ran into a horse trainer, but what happened after that? Yeah, that was when, you, when he was nine, yeah, and then he was shoveling at 12. How did you horse? Yeah, what happened after that? Well, Wait, who, who was the horse trainer? Uh, his name was Gene Wright. He was just a, I, I was raised in northwestern Indiana, so he was just a local horse trainer up in that area. Could train pleasure horses, cutting horses. You know, back then, as you know, these guys won't remember, but 
uh, you pretty much had to train everything Every to make a living, okay? Right. And I'm not sure that was all that bad because uh, we, I think we had a lot more, uh, uh, probably a lot better horsemen, more well-rounded horsemen. And there seemed to be more connection uh, within, uh, you know, with the di different disciplines and whatnot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's one that's what was going on when I was at that age and then as I start you know uh, fast forward a little bit I'm 12 I buy a two-year-old I train her for pleasure I'm showing around in Indiana and Illinois now instead of this local trainer my heroes are the Tommy Mannions who at that time was in Springfield Illinois uh, who showed up at every quarter horse show in the Midwest with 30, 35 head of horses and won everything from the yearling fillies to the cutting at night. And, uh, the I mean, reigning included. All of it included. Mm -hmm. I think, he, was he not second, first or second in the reigning, second in the reigning fraternity? You know, he hit a spot there where he decided he wanted to show in the reigning fraternity and actually uh, hired Brad Kelsall to train those fraternity horses for him. Brad trained them. And Tommy pretty much just catch ride him at the fraternity. Tommy could show anything. Uh, just, you know, he was just the ultimate showman. I did not know that. I did not have no good, idea that yeah. Brad yeah, I didn't know that either. You're going to learn a lot of things tonight, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we're here for. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. yeah that's really yeah. Cool. For sure, Brad trained, uh, you know, and he trained at least a couple of them every year for about three or four years. And Tommy was always... Always in the finals. Competitive, always competitive. Yeah. Uh, one year, he catch rode a buckskin uh, Dunbarry gelding for Paul Horn. Paul had broken his leg, uh, and Tommy catch rode him in the fraternity, and he was second on him. Maybe the highest. He never won it, but I, he was second on Paul's gelding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great story. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm showing <clears throat> at those quarter horse shows. Those kind of guys were my heroes. Uh, would always watch the reigning class, uh, you know, and then I, I started trying to do the, the reigning, I'd get a little horse or something, and uh, uh, kind of be a little project horse, and with very limited success. At that time, uh, Kenny Uppers wasn't far from me, he was up there in Chicago, and I'd go up and ride with Kenny, Kenny helped me quite a bit. Uh, give me some. Kenny some, helped a lot of guys. A right? lot of guys, yeah. and it needs to be known. A yeah. lot, a lot mm -hmm. of guys. Give me a lot of ideas and stuff. I went to the shows with them. Uh, you know, was a, was a lot of well, was a lot of help to me and whatnot. Uh, all through high school, I'd I'd had a little stint in between that where I'd trained a barrel horse that actually uh, was really a good horse. I sold them some local barrel horse people there that did really well with them. They ended up selling them to Martha Josie and they kept four or five horses with me all through high school and stuff. I rode their, their young horses, broke them, started them on barrels and whatnot. So I always had horses to ride through high school. And so stuff. you were a professional horse trainer through high school basically. Oh yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah I always had four or five horses. So I didn't have a lot. I mean I didn't play sports. Mm -hmm. uh, all I wanted to do was ride horses. Except for in the winter time, uh, you know. Didn't not, like going hunting. No, didn't like going <laughs> hunting. But I loved to play hockey. You know, uh, it was too cold. Ride horses. Ground was frozen, so I'd play. I'd play a little hockey up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Then I graduated from high school. Uh, moved. Uh, went to work for Ronnie Sharp. Uh, an NRHA Hall of Fame member, one of the founding fathers of the of NRHA. Uh, when I worked for Ronnie, we did, like I said, like everybody at that time, we did everything. Uh, rode some pleasure horses, riding horses. Uh, ended up uh, getting Doc Solano, son of Doc Bar. Uh, Ronnie stood him and, and showed him in the cutting and whatnot. And we started getting some of those colts and I'd start them on cattle and whatnot. So that's where I got a little bit introduced to uh, the cutting and whatnot. So what a lot of people don't know is that that was really raining has has evolved a lot. But the the first part of raining as it initiated was 
in the Ohio, uh, Illinois, the Midwest was a big part. That, oh, that's for really sure. where it started. The Midwest and the East. Uh, and New York and Long and, Island. Exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, it wasn't until, it was just a little Midwest and Eastern uh, little club until they moved the fraternity to Oklahoma City. And then it became national and shortly thereafter became glo a global event. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, nothing's, nothing's changed or done more to promote Raining than that move to Oklahoma City, which, uh, you know, when they um, involved in a cow horse just a little bit, when they started talking about moving the futurity from Reno to Fort Worth, I uh, just kind of made me chuckle because they, uh, and there's a lot of those guys from California that were dead set against it. And they, are, they already had the blueprint, right. you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 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 yeah, I mean, and, and that's done the same thing. So you were yeah. in the middle of all that back when that moved to Oklahoma City. What was everybody's, what, what did BH and everybody think about Well, it? they thought, I mean, I, you know, I never heard any really anything negative from, from BH. Uh, but just your local reining horse enthusiasts, I mean, people can be a little selfish, huh? I mean, you had people that didn't want it to move because uh, they they were pretty comfortable making that 45-minute drive to Columbus right, yeah. to watch the dirty finals, right. you yeah. know? And, and change comes hard for some people, but, you know, they wouldn't think a little bit further and think, you know, if this thing gets big... You know, maybe instead of selling those Colts for twenty five hundred, maybe one day we'll sell them for fifteen thousand. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I, you know what? I never, <clears throat> I, I've been around BH a little bit. I never knew BH, but what I did know of BH, um, I certainly wouldn't. I, I think he would have welcomed the opportunity to go beat somebody else anywhere. I don't think mm -hmm. he was afraid of anybody anywhere, anytime. No, yeah. Yeah. nobody. Yeah. And and was smart enough to understand that this could make reining horses worth more money. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, for sure, hundred percent. And uh, you know, first off, I mean, let's face it: when you put even back then, which the not, you know everything, uh, nothing costs like it does today. But when you look at the overall scheme of things, you breed that mare, you raise that colt up, you send it off. To, uh, uh, now we're we're worried about driving yeah. 16 hours and what that might cost. Right. Yeah. It, 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 it's nothing. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Right. In the big picture, it is absolutely nothing, especially when this is what, what you do for a living. Yeah. Right. If it's your business, I mean, there's people in, in business and any other business that travel all over the world. And, right. Yeah. yeah. It's just, and, and we've, we've come to accept that, uh, and then I moved to Oklahoma, so I wouldn't have to drive so far. <laughs> <laughs> That's my choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, so, when in your career did you evolve to just strictly reining horses, or am I skipping too far ahead? Or no, I'm lucky enough. Uh, other than when I was in high school and stuff, I, I mean, I call my business Sam Smith Reining Horses. Yeah. Uh, and now that doesn't mean that we didn't get the odd one. I can remember back in Ohio in the day. Uh, this literally happened. I mean, a guy pulled in my yard with a 16-foot blue stock trailer with a couple of Mustangs in it, and he asked me if we'd start them. And I said, if you can get them in that indoor arena and tie it to a post, I said, we'll start them. You know, so I, I never turned any business away. But no, I pretty much uh, always focused or, or specialized in reining horses. But when, did that, when did that happen? Like uh, after you worked for Roy or during that time? Ronnie. Ronnie, I mean, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, uh, you know, so uh, I'd worked for Ronnie for three years, four years, whatever. I like, I'd reigned a little as a kid. I'd, I'd was lucky enough to work, you know, start some Colts as we was getting those sons of, and you know, those progeny of Doc Solano up. I was starting on cattle. I really liked that, and I began to hear about this deal and. Reno called Snapple Bit Fraternity. Hell, they rained, they cut, worked a cow. I mean, it sounded pretty cool to me. I was 25, 26 years old. So I got a on a plane and went out there and watched it. 
uh, thought that might be something I might want to do. Moved to California, worked for somebody like Bobby Ingersoll. Uh, he would have been kind of the man at the time, Don mm -hmm. Murphy, whoever. And uh, I had a pretty good time out there. I remember that part. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but when I got home and NRHA was really starting to evolve. Uh, until this time, you know, really all there was was the futurity and a few weekend shows, very few, that had the, the open, just strictly the open and the non-pro. No other classes. And at that time, they started uh, the limited open and the limited non-pro, starting to get some more classes and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, I decided that, you know, I, I, I love draining, and I decided that maybe probably the best thing for me to do business-wise would be to stay in the Midwest and concentrate on raining. <laughs> so shortly after, uh, that's when I went to work for Bill. Okay. So, you know, there was a lot of, I'm getting that, and I, and I knew some of it, but, so, when you think about Dale Wilkinson, and, and who was before BH, mm -hmm. and BH, and Ronnie Sharp, and those guys, a lot of guys did the cutting and the raining. Did, did BH ever talk about going and trying the snaffle bit? Uh that's odd, because he would be, he would have been awesome at That's it. what I think. Awesome. I've never been around a human being as athletic horseback. Okay? He would have been awesome. Look, if you don't know Tom McCutcheon there, because he's the most athletic on a horse, uh, uh, athletic with a basketball, hockey stick, football, <laughs> baseball, uh, throwing cards, frisbees. I can keep going if you wanted me to. But, is he always like this? Shot put. <laughs> Shot put, javelin, decathlon, yeah. driving cars. Yeah, he games. can knit. <laughs> <laughs> Crochet needle. Okay, that guy okay. Is so fast. Well, Sorry. These guys realize. Yeah, that. I'm no. Glad they recognize the talent. You're amazing. You're amazing, Tom. Uh, Bill never showed, <laughs> you know, in the cow horse or in the snaffle bit fraternity, uh, but Tom Lyons. Uh, decided that he wanted to do it, <coughs> and he came to Bill for help with his rain work hmm. uh, for for quite a bit. In fact, I'm sure Bill flew to Reno and kind of helped him school those horses through the rain work and whatnot. And at that time, uh, uh, you know, the you can't show in the NCHA fraternity. You, you cannot show those horses Before, in a cutting. Yeah. I think it read at that right. time in a cutting right. prior to the big fraternity in Fort Worth. Right. I think at that time it read cutting. So Tom, he kind of fudged his way around the rule a little bit and he showed those horses in the snaffle bit and then showed them at Reno. Hmm. And then they, they changed the rule, but Bill helped him with, with, the, with the reigning part of it, hmm. for sure. Uh, you know, what people, and, and, and I think it's important that people, uh, you know, learn, I'm going to say learn, because a lot of the people that are in raining now are just hearing some of these names for the first time, and I, I feel like that's, that's kind of sad. But uh, uh, as you said, uh, you know, at that time, a lot of those guys would train a lot of different dis disciplines. Uh, Bill was a very avid cutter at, at a little bit prior to me going there. Uh, my, his business might have been 50-50. Miss White Trash, uh, who is Trash Adeus's mother, uh, when she was a three-year-old, the Congress had a little bit of a different rule. I think it was just that one year, but they wouldn't allow a horse to be shown at the Congress unless it had AQHA papers, and included it. It it superseded the rules for the. NRHA fraternity, which was held there. So he couldn't show her at the NRHA fraternity. Uh, so he trained her for the cutting fraternity and took her there and was sixth on her. Huh. Uh, which is huge for, you know, a hillbilly from Ohio. Right. Now, Dale had been there. Dale, you know, Dale won the cutting fraternity. Yeah. Dale, uh, you know, he's known as the father of reigning, but his 
you know, truth be known, I think his first love was cutting. He probably cut more than, well, I know he did. He cut more than he, than he ranked. I didn't know Bill Holm was six in the cut and fraternity. Oh, not just six in the cut and fraternity, but it uh, wasn't uncommon for him to uh, take a horse that he made the reigning fraternity finals with and then pull sliding plates off and take it to Fort Worth and show it in the cut and fraternity. He'd done that, you know, quite a few times. Uh that's pretty cool. Miss mm -hmm. White Trash. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I can remember when I worked for Ronnie, we had a cutting at the house, and he brought Miss White Trash there and won the open on her. He would take that mare, and he would shower in a big, in, and, the, and the cutting was big in Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky. Uh, he'd win the open on one weekend, put sliding plates on her and haul her to New York and win the open raining on her. Wow. I mean, and she was just... She was just that good. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so, did, where did Dale, Dale was before all those guys, right? Sure. And did he, did, was he an influence on any of those guys that you knew? Did, did they, because he did the cutting and the raining? Well, Ronnie worked for Dale. Okay. BH worked for Dale. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. I didn't know all that. Yeah. So, he was an influence on all those guys. All basically. those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of them worked for him, and the ones that didn't, uh, you know, we're sure influenced by him. I mean, not uh, not just, I mean, Bill worked for Dale. The list goes on. I mean, Sid Griffith, who's one, who was, I think maybe still, if unless Andre Fapani may have won, the, but what, until that time, was the youngest, <laughs> was the youngest person to win the uh, reign of 30. It might have been him. <laughs> yeah, I forgot him. <laughs> I forgot him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He had that one good year. Yeah. <laughs> I had to do that. Yeah. That's okay. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're fine. Yeah. You have no idea what he endures at the park. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Ah, uh, Clark Bradley, you know, worked for Dale, Doug Lilly. I mean, uh, so, yeah, all, all those guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and, and yeah, that's crazy what the what that part of the country produced. You know, Doug Lilly and I were real good friends, and and all those guys could do like we were talking before. That Doug Lilly could beat you in the halter class. He could oh, beat yeah. you in the two year old pleasure class. He could beat you in the rain class. In the rain, I mean, I mean, he's a world champion on a rain in the rain. I mean, he did. Those guys could all do it all. Now, that said. This is a different time. For sure. Right. So level yeah. of competition so you know, so hot, much higher and it's it's yes. different. But uh but that really to me created the horsemen that we don't see today. Um and this is just this is just my opinion, it's worth absolutely nothing. But I think the the horses that we have bred today overcome some of the lack of horsemen that we have. A lot. You know, would you agree with that? I would, yeah. And that's something I think about uh, quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> you know, the horses that these younger people are training now, they, they do all this stuff. They yeah. all turn. They all stop. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We had to pull some of that out of those horses back then. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Also, the level of competition so much, so yeah, much higher. For so, sure. it, yeah. we've talked about it before. You'd go to the fraternity twenty years ago, uh, and there was there was BH and Tim and Loom and Craig Johnson and maybe Pete. There was maybe five or six guys. They had to not fall off, right? And they were in the finals. Yeah, you know, no matter what happened, they they were they could have like a really bad run. And still get marked high enough to be in the finals because those guys were just ahead of everybody else. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I think now we've talked about this before. I think now you see, you don't see those guys. You don't see any of the top guys. You can be a top guy, walk in there, have an average run, and most of the time they're going to get marked an average score. Yep. Now, wasn't like that as as recent. I think as five years ago, it wasn't like that. And it's not like that every time, but for the most part, you got to be legit now. You yep. know, you got to be legit to walk in there. And that, uh, where were we like? Where the heck were we? 
Well, before the final, before the semifinals at the fraternity this year, I don't know that I've ever seen seventy-five three-year-old reigning horses in one place mm-hmm. that broke that could do that much. Right. I mean, it's just. But but now I mean, halter horses look like halter horses. Pleasure horses look like pleasure horses. Rain. They all look yes. like they've yeah. taken their own specific pedigree, a certain direction to what appeals to them. You could no more take. A pleasure horse out of the pleasure horse pen today and make it brainer than man. Or a halter horse into a rainer or anything. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know it's that so halter, specialized. I can't remember a lot of halter horses that made rainers back in the day, but I can certainly, there was a lot of pleasure horses. Rope and shoot. Yep. There was a lot of two-year-old pleasure horses that did well and then uh, went on and had success in the rain, and that just couldn't happen today. Yeah. You know, it just couldn't happen today. Yeah. Well, I even remember Ron Thompson's picture on his Facebook page a few years ago when he's at the World Show with his Rainer, and it's a quarter horse World Show. They're both quarter horses. His Rainer next to a, a hunter jumper horse, and they're a foot and a half different in height. They're 500 pounds different in weight, and they look yeah. identical other than one is... One and a half times larger than yeah, the Yeah, it's other. like here and here. Quarter horse encompasses un- encompasses a lot of a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, this is it's fun for me because there's a lot of stuff I didn't know, and I told somebody today. I said I'm so excited to have Sam on the show because there's nobody has more stories than Sam except maybe Bob Loomis <laughs> and Sam can tell his yeah you can tell him uh, yeah, yeah that's right let's keep some of them I'll, ta- I'll tell one right now just a little Bob story so and and I have so much respect for Bob as a as a horseman and and as a breeder, a livestock breeder, because uh, you know there's there's been a lot of people that have accomplished uh, quite a lot in the horse industry, but they started with something. Uh, Bob told me a hundred years ago, you know, when he was training horses, whenever he saw a mare that he liked or a mare that he was showing against that he couldn't beat, he bought her. Yeah, yeah. and he, he, told he, told us he said. On the ship. and he told me we were flying. To Florida, or we had connecting flights in Atlanta, and we flew to Florida several years ago, judge a show, and got to talking about uh, BH. And he said he came uh, to, I think, the second reign of fraternity, but it was his first time there. And he said he watched what Bill and Jim Willoughby and some of those guys were doing with those horses, and he said he knew right from the start the only way that he was going to play with, the, with those guys is if he had better horse than they did. And it served him well. Served him. Served him well. And I say livestock breeder because uh, not only has he done it with the horses, but with Longhorn cattle. You know, mm-hmm. as you know. So uh, it's it's yeah. This is pretty a, amazing. This, this is a true story. I was putting together a group of horses for uh, Oldenburg Farms, and a brood, bunch of broodmares. They wanted to be. They want to have a great set of broodmares and and be a big time breeder in the business and. So I started putting a few together, and, and they said, I said, you know, I want to breed a couple to top sale whiz, and let, let's do that. And they said, well, where's he? I said, well, he's at Bob Loomis's. And they're like, you know Bob Loomis? I said, well, yeah, I've known Bob Loomis forever. Well, I didn't know he had horses. He's huge in the Longhorns. Yeah. I mean, they only knew him from the Longhorns. For sure, yeah. And he, because towards... You know, he always messed with the Longhorns, but as he started to, you know, do a, a little bit less in the rain and horse business, I mean, they, I guess he's as big or bigger in the mm-hmm. Longhorn business as he is in the, yeah. in the rain and horse business. Yeah, he's the guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he's the guy. Yep. Yeah. And, which is incredible. I mean, I've been told that he, you know, he's made Longhorns worth money. Right. And if anybody would do that, It'd it Bob. would be Bob, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's nobody that knows more about making money anywhere than Bob Loomis. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great, that's a fun story. And you got to have some fun kind of stories from working with BH for four years. I got one in particular I'd like to share, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. I huh? would love to hear it. I think it... 
Did he drive a pickup truck into a lake? Yeah, I heard that <laughs> one. I, you know, he'd won a pickup at, by winning the Congress. Uh, it wasn't just a pickup, it was the pickup. But I kind of, you know, I got up one morning and uh, headed, was walking from the bunkhouse up to the barn and that pickup that he won at the Congress, it was sitting in a lake, like clear up to the windows, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but what's weird is like after you're there for three years, I'm just walking. Uh, you <laughs> kind of, it's like it's normal. Like <laughs> you don't even go, oh my God, there's a pickup in, you know? You're just thinking, shit, they had fun last night, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there was some of that stuff that went on, I guess, you know? Uh, uh, but, but this one particular story, so you got to talking about St. Paul. We went up to St. Paul one year, and uh, uh, Bill had three derby horses. Uh, I, I'm the, on, on Dave's show, which I was watching on Facebook, I heard you mention Randy Cupberth, who needs mention, but uh, he had, he'd trained a... A black son of Great Pine, uh, I think for Henry Uvino, made 30 finals, but then they sent him to Bill. Sent him to Bill as a four year old. And he had that horse, that black stud, and he had a Was real. Vincent's My Way? Vincent's My Way, yes, sir. And he had a, a little filly, a full sister to I'm Not Trash, that I liked a lot better, or I mean to Trash a Day, as her name was I'm Not Trash, uh, that was just. A little soft moving, but real borderline hot, feely, touchy, uh, but very talented mare. Now she's a four year old. And then he had this uh, uh, a mare that belonged to Bill Cool that was by his halter horse bred stud. Talking about halter horses. So he had these two, and then he had this halter horse. So he shows in the first go round. He wins the first go on the black stud, he's second on the, on the mare. And he doesn't make the finals on the uh, one of Bill Cools. Another first uh, at uh, the Minnesota Derby was the consolation class. Yep. Huh? You've been part of that before. Uh, yep. We'll get to that. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and so have I. <laughs> but uh, so they got this consolation class. Uh, nobody knows what really what it is, but it's a uh, day after the first go round and. They're going to take the next 30 horses, and if you win the damn thing, you get shown the finals. Not a bad deal, huh? So uh, the next morning, I'm at the barn, and there you start the class, and Bill's down to draw somewhere, and he ain't there. So, you know, I'm doing chores, whatever, and he's not coming, so I'm not really sure what to do. So I go ahead and I saddle the mare. You know, when he gets there, she's going to be saddled. Well, they're going down through the draw, and he still ain't coming. It's not there, so I'm thinking, I'm leading her up to the arena. You know, if he shows up, she's going to be there. It's, you know, it's going to be on him. I'm not really sure what to do. I'm not showing her. I know that. I don't think I could have. I mean, according to the rules, and I know, like, what wasn't I going to be able to show her? But uh, that was his deal. So, uh, finally... He's and you can't make this up, right? He's literally on deck and he shows up and he's got his little blue shirt on and his tan chaps. And I mean, he looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I like I've seen him look bad before. This was a whole different level. They now I knew they really had a good time that night. So he gets up on that mare and he looks at her and he goes, Honey, I'd I'd, I'd really like to do something to you, he said, but I don't feel like I'm up to it. <laughs> and literally, she hadn't been out of the stall since the first go-round. I walked her on the pavement, and I'm holding her there like some dumbass. He gets on her, and those big gates up there at St. Paul, they swing open, and he goes, all right, buddy, it's your turn. <laughs> Bill goes in there. They shut the gates. I don't know what happened. I'm just hanging out outside there. And uh, he's walking out the pen, and they announce his score. It's a 225. And he stumbles off that mare and he hands her to me. And he says, uh, I'm not feeling too good. He says, if somebody ties us, 
Tell them we'll just be second. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. So, you know, he got through that okay. And uh, that was probably first go Monday. That might have been a Tuesday. Wednesday night, there's a 5,000 added open. And, uh, well, Wednesday evening, he's saddling that black stud. I'm like, you can go ride him a little bit? He said, hell no, I ain't gonna ride him. He said, I, I sh I'm gonna show him in that open. He said, hell, I gotta ride him anyway. Might as well be showing him. <laughs> so, he wow. sh so he showed him that Wednesday night and won that, won that open on him. I mean, it was a big, pretty yeah, big deal. I remember. He wins that open, and then Saturday night's the finals. And as you'd remember, there, there were, at least the, the derby up there, there was like no warm up. They put down a little sand no. on the side yeah. of the Coliseum. Yeah. It was like a hundred, you know, it might have been 60 by 100. Just yeah. a little place to try around and go show. Yep. So, you know, about an hour before the final start, uh, we saddled those horses up. And I'm like, you know, they closed the arena. Where are you going to ride them? He said, I think I know a place. So he takes them down there. He's, uh, he's on that little mare, and I'm on that black stud, and we walk down there in the parking lot where they park the trailers. It's like gravel, kind of like cinders, you know? And uh, I kind of look around. He said, this will do. And he lopes off on that mare, and he just lopes her around the parking lot and stuff. Usually he's just kind of petting on her and, he didn't do a damn thing to her. He brings her back and he said, I think she's ready. And he gets on that black stud and he gathers up the reins in one hand and he takes the bridle reins and he whips them over the head, if I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's what happened. And he takes off running and he's running this black thing around the parking lot. And a lot of, I mean, there were some aluminum trailers there, but a lot of them were like st still steel, you know? Yeah. And I hear gravel just spraying off these <laughs> things. <laughs> and he's, he's running, and how we talked about today about those horses, he's lifting his head one way. I mean, he's trying to see if he can knock him off his feet. He wants this thing's attention. And, and he's running him around there. And sometimes I'd see him, sometimes I wouldn't. And pretty soon I see him, he comes running out from behind them trailers. He's running wide open. And he runs past me and he holds his hand still and he says, whoa. And that black horse put his butt on the ground and stopped in that rock for about 20 feet. And he just looked over at me and he said, let's walk on up there. He said, I think they're ready. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. So a lot of levels of that story kind of got an idea that he might party a little, you know. And but what I want you to get out of it was uh, he could train. There wasn't any particular kind of horse that he had to have right. fit him. Mm -hmm. There he had two horses that were polar opposites. Polar opposites. I watch him. Tra he trained a lot of good mares, and and that's what he would prefer. Because he didn't mind to ride a horse a little bit, but he could he could ride and get you know and show a, a mare like that that was touchy feely, but knew how to handle a stud as right. well. And mm -hmm. and basically was so competitive and so talented he was gonna find a way to beat you. Yeah, but uh, a lot a lot <clears throat> better horse trainer I think than maybe uh, a lot of people ever gave him credit for. A lot of times the horses. Uh, and I'm going to say more early in his career than later, but they might not be as broke as a lot of people's because they didn't have to be. Yeah. I mean, any of us are only going to work as hard as we need to. He knew that he could outshow everyone. If he could just have them close, right. he yeah. could play golf, you know, at least once a week, whatever, you know. Uh, his, I'm, going, I'm going to play golf this week. His, his <laughs> brother, oddly enough, Paul, was just the total opposite. Paul was a lot better horse trainer than Bill because he had not as much confidence in the show pen. Uh, so, therefore, his horses were trained uh, really, really well. Right. You know? Uh, and, there, you know, there's, there was a saying back in the, in the day, there's nothing better than a Bill Horn showing a Paul Horn trained 
uh, horse, which is another quick story that introduced me or made me want to do reining was I'm a kid at the Congress and hanging on a fence and you may have heard it but the, the runoff where uh, BH tied with himself he was showing his mare Miss White Trash and Paul had broken his leg and he asked Bill to catch ride uh, uh, a mare named I'm Great too, a daughter of Great Pine that he had trained and uh, uh, at that time, that was before there was any derbies or anything. So the Open at the Congress, it had 70, 80 head of horses, the best aged horses in the, in the country. It was where you showed them. Right. And uh, so, uh, yeah, he tied those two horses. It was quite a lot. I mean, that Coliseum in Columbus was filled to the rafters. A uh, lot, uh, lot of excitement and stuff. And he ran it off and actually won it with with Paul's mayor. It was pretty hmm. pretty cool thing to witness. Yeah, I remember hearing that. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, we talk about, and it has, the rain has grown so much, and Oklahoma City's a bigger pen and, and all of that, and, you know, the crowds there pre-COVID, uh, the last, you know, in, in 2019, the crowd was huge for the semifinals and the finals, but it's hard to replicate what the Congress used to be in that little coliseum. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was just... And and you know what? Back then, we didn't have we didn't have internet. We didn't have all access all the time to all these other things. Things meant more. Oh, 100%. You know? Yeah. I mean, that finals meant more. All of that meant more than it does now. And you had to be there. You couldn't watch a live stream. Right, right. You know, it was all of that stuff made it special, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I have a I have a consolation story to share too. I was working in Italy, and Tim had one for me to catch right when I came back. So I came back and I caught rode it in the fraternity, missed the finals by point or something, but I made this, the consolation. And the consolation at that time they had it for the open. It was held in the Coliseum. Right. And uh, tied BH. They only took one horse. <laughs> And BH, BH and I tied to win it. Twice. And we came out and they said, well, they're going to go to a tiebreaker judge. <laughs> and I walked past Mandy and I said, oh, well, maybe it wasn't Mandy. I don't know. That was a long time ago. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> yeah, I mean, I walked by somebody, Tim maybe, and I said, yeah, they're going to tiebreaker judge. It ain't going to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh and yeah, it wasn't me. Yeah, yeah, I knew. I, I knew right away when we tied. Yeah, I wasn't. No, so I remember that. And then a couple of years later, uh, I tied. I tied to win the consolation with Todd Summers, and uh, uh, Todd had went before me. And I see Alan Mitchell's coming up the alleyway. It might have been the very next year after that, and. Uh, I saw Alan, I kind of had an idea of what he had in mind. I, I knew he wasn't going to make his run because it wasn't great. When right. I, so I, I said, I said, you're not going to make his run at all. He, he said, yeah, we'll just take both of you. I said, is, yeah. is that all right? I said, uh, I said, yeah, but I said, let me mess with Todd just a little bit first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And yeah. I thought you'd like this. So yeah, yeah. that's always fun. Todd. So Todd's... Todd's over there, fun. I mean, he's, he's just, he's turning his horse around, I mean, he is raking that thing, I know, man, I'm giving, my horse is out in the road, now. I got my girls out there walking him in the fresh air, letting, trying to let him air up, and I'm over there, Todd, oh God, I said, you're going to have to bring more than that this time, boy, <laughs> <laughs> and he spurred this thing, I said, I said, just wait, I said, they're going to take us both, God damn. <laughs> I, I have a great Todd Summers runoff story, and I shouldn't tell it, but that makes it even better. <laughs> and I like Todd Summers a lot, and I like Garth Brown a lot, but you guys know this story, I'm sure. <laughs> Never heard it before in my life. Really? Yeah, it was for the, in the Derby, right? Todd, yeah. yeah. Garth runoff story. Yeah. Todd and Garth tied to win the Derby. And, okay, this is rumor. This is... Rumor and speculation. They both went oh, off pattern in the runoff, didn't they? Now, wait a minute. You so, can't, you so can't do this is kind of fuzzy in my mind. Yeah, yeah. well, you're going to remember in a minute. <laughs> so, the rumor is that Todd told Garth, we'll just both go off pattern. We'll be, we'll be co champions. Right. So, Todd runs in there. It's pattern 10. 
He runs in there and stops big, turns big, runs the circles to the right big. I mean, he's running. Changes leads, goes fast instead of slow. Off pattern. Everybody's going, whoa, whoa, slow, slow, slow. Todd pulls up, walks out the chute, says to Garth, why well, did my part? <laughs> so then Garth ran in there, stopped, and did too many spins, and they died. <laughs> yeah, I think that was, I think there was a little bit of trickery when we're talking about, oh, I'll never forget that. Yeah. I thought that, you know what? That was pretty, pretty crafty of old Todd. <laughs> To, <laughs> to walk in there and do that because my from where I was sitting, Todd Summers was trying to win that rating. Right? Yeah, a hundred percent trying to win that rating uh -huh. and went off pattern on pattern ten, which happens. Yes, which happens, and and then Garth, you know, went off pattern two. And in fairness to Garth, I'm sure Garth was getting his horse ready. He didn't notice and had no idea what yeah. what was happening yeah. in the pen. Yeah. And in fairness to me. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you that. <laughs> Maybe that was just my observation. Very <laughs> good. As an innocent bystander, yeah, yeah. that was just my observation. Yeah. Maybe that's all bullshit. But yeah. that's what I saw. That's kind of how I remember it. Now, <laughs> yeah. To bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's. There's been a lot of. There's been a few runoff stories like that. That's but, pretty good. So, did you go to any of those? When I was a kid, I never went to any of the like the big event or any of those rainings way out on the East Coast. Right. But I imagine those rainings with Anthony and Horn and who else was a player at that point in time in their league? Oh, you know, Bob Mack? Yeah. For sure. 100%. Yeah. yeah. Roger Brazo? Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh,. Those are the main guys. You know, Bill Waterman, if he had a good horse. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, 100%. I'm glad you brought up those names because, mm -hmm. you know, Bob Mack, he played at the top of that fraternity. Well, I never saw a horse at that point in time. Never saw a horse turn that fast in my life. Never. Yeah. And he had a couple of them. That fast. And they'd be competitive today. They'd be turning ones today. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Roger Bozo, he always was showed up with good horses. And, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I... Uh, back, you know, uh, Guy Gautier, yep. when, you know, before he passed. Uh, so I never I never really got to Long Island. I would show on the East Coast, you know, when I was working for Bill in that era, uh, the Joe Cody Classic was huge. Right. So we'd right. always go to Willowbrook, 4th of July weekend. Uh Northampton, Massachusetts, though, it had a, had a big uh, trophy rain in, in August. Uh, it'd have a nice futurity and big open and all pro and whatnot, good facility. Uh, so, yeah, I went to, went to all those, you know, those shows. So, getting back to you, so now... It is about me. All, we should. <laughs> I mean, just saying. <laughs> Fair enough. All the success that you've had over the years in the rain, and now you're... I, I don't know if you had done the cow horse before, but now you made the finals at the at the Snafflebit Fraternity this last year. Yeah, 2019. Yeah. Uh, made the limited open finals, which I was real proud of on a, a little metallic cat mare that I had trained. Uh, and had the second highest uh, seller in the two-year-old sale. Right. So, so what, <coughs> what piqued your interest to yeah. go that direction? Mm -hmm. Well, so... As we, you know, as I talked about earlier, I had that interest a uh, long time ago, long time ago. Uh, put it on hold. Uh, and then Todd Crawford asked us to come out there to Ardmore during that uh, celebrity deal. Yeah, yeah, celebrity man. deal. History and champions. Uh, you know, uh, thought that was pretty cool, even though all they really wanted was somebody to fall off. Uh, I almost did that. Yeah. <laughs> they almost I did died. not, but I almost, it was close. They almost got their wish because Tom almost fell off. So, yeah, and it, I might as well fell off. I didn't do very good, but I had a blast. Uh, so, a couple years later, uh, I think it was a couple years later, Todd asked uh, actually me and Brian Bell to do it, and a bunch of uh, million dollar cutting horse riders were going to do it. 
uh, Sean, Sean Flynn was there, Matt Gaines, uh, uh, several of them. And uh, I told Todd I'd do it if he let me ride the paint horse. Uh, he, at that time, he had a horse called Cookin' Marauder that he'd won way over 100000 on a good horse. And uh, he said, yeah, you can, you can ride the paint horse. So uh, I, the first time I did it, the first time I'd ever went down the fence or anything was that night in front of those people because I figured that's what they wanted. You know, right. it was kind of a joke. So, uh, you know, I told Todd I wanted to ride that paint horse, and I was coming out the day before, and I wanted, you know, I wanted to know where the buttons were, what's the, you know, what we're supposed to do. So he let me ride him and help me with him just a little bit. He's a good horse, and I showed him that night. I marked 74 on him down the fence, and uh, I was pretty sure that that's something that I wanted to do. Uh, not to make the story too long, but I went to Utah to judge a horse show, and there was a young man there that was showing. He showed in about every class, and he was just having hell. Was never on the right lead, uh, just just was having trouble. And when he wasn't showing, he was scribing for me. So we got to be kind of buddies by Sunday, and I told him that and found out that he, he was being raised by his grandmother. I said, you know, if you can get your grandmother to buy you a plane ticket to Oklahoma City, I said, I'll come up there and pick you up, and you come spend a couple weeks with me, and I'll help you with your riding just a little bit. Well, I'm getting on a plane Sunday night. I'm feeling real good about myself because I did my good deed, and I'm thinking I'm never going to hear from this kid in my life. And I get off the plane in Oklahoma City, and he's left me a voicemail. Said I'm going to be there Tuesday at 6 o'clock. <laughs> So I go pick him up, and long story short, he's there for a couple weeks, and we get to be pretty good, pretty good friends. And uh, his grandmother wants me to find a horse for him. Well, we're at the fraternity. Brian Bell's got a got a little stud there uh, that Steve Metcalf had trained. He'd won fifteen thousand in reining, but he'd won sixty five thousand in cow horse. And we go to try him, and that kid lopes him off on the right lead or on an incorrect lead, and that horse goes one stride and it goes in a, into the correct lead. I looked at Brian and I said, well, take it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was the horse for Colton. <laughs> so long story short, I told his grandmother, they lived in Utah, I said, look, here's the deal. I said, you know, when he's not here showing him in the rain, and how about I show him in the cow horse a little bit? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Well, I started showing him, and... and and, uh, and doing well with it. Well, I did yeah. good with him, yeah. You know, those good horses, they make you think something's easy. So yeah. the first time I'm going to show them, it's in March. It's at a cow horse show. And I, I, you know, I know you box a little bit, make two fence turn, circle a cow. I mean, yeah, it's simple. Can, yeah. simple. So I'm going to Ardmore, and I'm, gonna, I'm going the day before. I'm supposed to school this thing. Well, you know, the horse trainer in me has got all these ideas, and but I need to practice, and I'm right. And, and so... And Crawford's supposed to help me, but I, I, they go, it's your turn. And I turn around and look, and he's in the back pen. He's giving a clinic back there. <laughs> and I kind of go like this, and, well, nobody's around, which maybe ain't bad. So, so I trot down there, and they kick a cow out. And I, I'm in that big arena back there, and I'm just chasing this thing all over. <laughs> and I know this is just, it's just horrible. <laughs> I mean, I'm holding on to his face, and he's running through the bridle because he—it's just horrible. But I'm—I kind of go like this a couple times. There's nobody there. I'm thinking, oh, this is okay. They don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the horse and I—we both get out of air, and I say, "Yeah, I'm done." And I walk to the gate, and I'll be damned with Chris Dawson in there. And he's like, dude, dude, that's that's not really what we need to be doing right now. You know, and he's going on, and I'm just looking at him. And finally, when he gets done scolding me, I look at him, and I go, I'm kind of like a non-pro rainer that just tried to mark a 76 in a paid warm-up, right? He goes, yeah, yeah, something like that. <laughs> he said, come on in here. I'll, he said, I'll help you a little bit, and we'll get another cow. And, and he, he kind of schooled me on another cow a little bit, and... Uh, and then later, the, the next day, I marked like a 71 on that horse. And, a, and then the second time I showed him, like, marked like a two and a half. But it, it was a really, really good little horse that, that I learned a lot from. Uh, ended up, uh, I won the limited open bridal class at Reno on him and, and all kinds of stuff. Good horse. Yeah. Really good cool. horse. 
That's cool. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's, and you know, it's a little bit, I think it's it's got to be fun for you to do something. As many rainers as you've rode, and we talked about a little bit earlier, fun to do something with. Different. Just a little mix it up yeah. a little bit. It, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's really freshened things up for me. It makes me want to go to the barn. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. I'm going gonna, yeah. I'm gonna to tell you a little story. It's crazy. Like, we went, I had to go. I have a customer that has two, had two, uh, two-year-olds. Three. Three two-year-olds. Yeah, two, I got my two-year-olds. Two. He had three two-year-olds to come to pick up. So I sent my boys with the stock trailer. They hadn't been touched at all. Yep. So I run up there. I thought, well, they need supervision, right? So I ran up there to, to supervise this. And we pull in, and these two-year-olds are healthy. I mean, they are <laughs> yeah, they're big, big and fat and proud of themselves. And not, not halter broke. Right? Not halter broke. All stud colts. And, you know, it took me about two hours to get all on the trailer. But you know what? At the end of it, I told Mandy, I said, it reminded me why I love the horse business. Right. Because it was fun for me to, to go and work with those colts and teach those colts. It's just something so simple about getting those colts onto that trailer. And it was a step back in time. Yep where we used to have to deal with that stuff. And it was fun. I mean, like, I met Mandy for lunch, and I was an hour and a half late. <laughs> but, and, and I had, you know, blood running out of my hand because one of them pulled back and tore my fingernail off. And, but it was still so much fun to remember that that's why I became a horse trainer. Right. To, to know horses, to teach horses, to... It's not all about every day circling turn and stop and you know that was something different and i i mean it was it was great i mean it really it kind of energized me a little bit hmm. and uh it was fun yeah it was fun and i think we all deal with that a little bit you know when you got it's fun when you're a kid and you get to a point when you're riding so many horses every day it's, and it gets a big grind it gets sure. the yeah. big grind yeah. And, yeah. And, and everybody says Oh, you're, you know, how many times train. have we heard, you're so lucky to get to ride all day. You get to ride all day. Yeah. You know, and, it, and we are lucky. Yeah, for sure. Yes. I'm not saying we're not lucky. But it's, it's, not, it's not like you skip to the barn and it's just fun every day. Yeah. There's days where it's fun and there's, there's horses where it's fun. Yep. If you put your best horses at the beginning of your string, sometimes it's fun till lunchtime. <laughs> and then after that, it's not if so you're much lucky. Fun. If yeah. you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah, yeah. It's for, sometimes it's fun until brunch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. But um, you know, we're all lucky to be able to to do what we love to do, and and have all made a good living at it. And you know, when you started, there was. You did it only because you loved it. Sure. Only because you loved it. There wasn't the opportunity that there is for the young guys today to actually make a living out of it, you know? I mean, you could make a living, but it was meager for a long time. Right. I'm quite sure Bill Horn did not pay you a large sum of money to work for him. Or at all. <laughs> Just like, just like I didn't get paid a lot of money in my, you know, I worked for Jim no, Dudley. And no, wait was, a minute. The first, let's, let's, just, let's just ask. I mean, the first month, whatever, your first paycheck from Bill, your first agreement. you remember it? What was it? I don't remember what the money was, but I can remember him taking me. He had this bunkhouse. It's it, it started out being a chicken coop, and then he made it into a shed for Miss White Trash. And then she wouldn't go in it anymore, so he turned it into a bunkhouse for the help. Nice. <laughs> but uh, actually, I mean, when I, I mean, I guess I can say it now, because he didn't pay me much, but I, uh, I kind of traded around some horses and stuff while I worked for him. And uh, so I had a, your own money trading. I had an envelope in that bunkhouse. The only thing I did, I prayed every night that some bitch wouldn't burn down. Uh, I had more money when I worked for Bill than I've ever had. I mean, you know, I say that, but you didn't have any bills then. Right. Yeah. No overhead. You anything. can make. I mean, it's 
it ain't that hard to make money. It's keeping it that's hard. Yeah. yeah. You know, so you got your own place, and it, yeah, you get it. Just it comes in one end, goes out the other. But hundred percent. Yeah. When I was really doing good that last year, that I he actually gave me a really good opportunity uh, to get started because I knew I could train the horses after I, I worked actually rode horses for Bill for three years, but uh, and I wanted to branch out on my own, but I really didn't know how to get started. And uh, I had been doing the breeding, uh, stood BH form while I was there the last two of those three years or something. Uh, and uh, he come to me and said, you know, if you want to get started here, just stand my horse. I'll give you five stalls and, uh, and, and do the breeding. And uh, I mean, we made that deal. Uh, you know, I made a phone call and then five stalls were full and I made another one and I had horses up the road at a boarding stable. And I did that to the end of the year. And, uh, you know, he and I agreed that I kind of need to, you know, kind of sprout my wings and, and get my own place. I, I leased a place for a couple of years and then bought a place there in Ohio. But uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty easy to have some, some money when you don't have any bills, you know? Yeah, yeah, sure. 100%. Yeah. And, you know, that's the biggest thing we run into now. You think you lived in that chicken coop. I lived in a 100-year-old trailer house that you couldn't put both feet in the bathtub without it falling through the, the floor. Right. And didn't, like, never gave it two thoughts. No. Yeah. The problem now, uh, I mean, people expect more. Yeah, I hired somebody, and I got a, a double-wide home that my help lives in. Uh, I hired somebody, and they were moving in, and they found some mold in there, and they left, which was okay. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, but, a, and a double-wide in Oklahoma. That's I mean, wow. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's, that's like that's like throwing a hundred dollar bill on the <laughs> counter for a flip phone. But, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so as uh, you know, you and I are kind of in competition with other trainers. Uh, it seems like that they have certain standards now. Yeah, you know, and you got to provide, you got to do this, and you got to do that because there's another job down the road. Yeah, yeah. There was there was. Very few opportunities for us when when we were that age and and for sure you know, there wasn't that many guys doing this. Now everybody I know is looking for help. Somebody pulled into my place today to drop off a horse for rehab. Said, "Hey, you know where I can hire somebody that can ride?" Right. No, and, yeah. but if you find two, call me. Yeah. It's I mean it's we're always short. Everybody's short. Yeah. Everybody's short. So. I'm not sure. No, and I, you won't give me that guy's number either. <laughs> uh, but no, it's it's a, it's a different it's a different day. But it's a, in my opinion, it is it, to be a horse trainer. It's never been better than today. I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's never been better than today. Horses are good. Clients are good. Um, you know, opportunities to make money are good. The yearling sales are at an all-time high. I mean, it's just, it, it finally, yearlings are bringing enough money where you can afford to breed them. Right. And they have to. I right. mean, they have to. When yearling sales are averaging, you know, nine or 10,000, that's not good for the industry. Right. When they're averaging 20,000, now we're getting somewhere. Hmm. And I think that's just, um, you know, it, it comes from, Go try and find a go try and find a three year old that you like. Try and find a two year old that you like. Just drive around, see if you can find one. Hey, boy, and then I got see if the you can buy. It. For you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, seven one three. Yeah. Nine three five four. <laughs> we work Monday through Sunday. You got way to chat. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know how the gunny likes to price his, right? Yeah. <laughs> He thinks they're all the fraternity winners. Everyone's Super Mario. Dang. That's right. I swung a hit once. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, well, uh, man, that yeah. went fast. Today. Real fast. Super fast.
And so, we haven't talked to anybody for 90 minutes in a long time. Yeah. No. Tom's colorblind, but I have a black pen. Yeah. yeah. We're. <laughs> I'm like thirty minutes. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little disappointed that we've talked ninety minutes and you haven't asked me about Hollywood White. I don't know if that's a good thing. Oh, or dude, that. oh. You know what? Huh? Hollywood my White. Famous, my one <laughs> that's memory right. was whenever I was a kid watching you show Hollywood White, though, and I uh, remember you running him around that day. The only reason that I even wanted to bring it up because I don't think maybe uh, not very many people know where that horse got his start. Mm -hmm. Who showed that horse in the dirty? Eddie. Yeah. Really? Really? Mm -hmm. No kidding. He, when Sam showed him, he went faster than he did. I <laughs> in fairness to Tom, he he and in fairness to Tom, he showed him. He can't, he pretty much catch rode him. He was uh, training in Italy, right? Uh, and he had our friend Dale Harvey train that horse. Really? Uh -huh. I didn't know that. Isn't that right? I didn't know that either. Huh. And then Tom showed him. And then uh, the Van Reese family bought that horse when Brent. I, I remember that back when Barn Six was twelve foot tall. Remember that? Yeah. Barn Six was just a little. It wasn't the big fancy coliseum that it is now. Right. It was just a building that was a shed. Yeah, it was a shed. Maybe twelve feet tall, and it was yeah. Yep. Yeah. It'd be warmer than it is now. And Scott yeah. actually had the horse as a. Uh, you got you'd gotten him from Scott. Yeah, I bought him from Scott. Uh, Richie Richie Greenberg owned right. him, and I remember seeing him at Scott's, and I wouldn't remember, but he was just a little white thing in the, yep. in the pasture. And his mother was black. Yep. <laughs> well, I remember you showing him, and that thing did everything you wanted him to do, and I watched you show him multiple times. Yeah, because you were world champion on him, right? Saddle Smith Open champion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I don't know if they had the saddlesmith then, maybe. But what, you know, uh, what, I mean, it was just an accident that I actually ended up showing that horse. That horse was bought for the uh, Mar Van Rees showing a non-pro, and she actually was reserve world champion, limited non-pro on him in 96. And uh, at the end of the year at the Congress, they asked me if I wanted to show him in the open, and I never thought thought. I mean, it was just her little toy. I thought, yeah, I'll show him, I guess. So I showed him at the Congress, and I actually had the most points. So I was sitting in the gate waiting to go in and get my picture taken, and it was taking the longest time, and then all of a sudden, they said that they recalculated the scores and that Sean Flair did it actually work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, no way. Yeah, I don't think he was. I'm not sure he could drive then. Yeah. He was he was pretty young. So yeah. I that, thought, it was a little bit like when BH and I tied. A, <laughs> lot, a yeah. lot like that. That's right. <laughs> so so, but then uh, we were getting ready to go to Florida the next uh, January, and Mar was going to show him in an all pro down there, and she decided she couldn't miss that much school, and they asked me to show him, and uh, we went down there. And uh, the horse just did something that was uh, just stupid. I mean, I won, I think they had four opens, I won all of them. And don't have a clue why, how. Uh, he, was just, he was just on his game. And uh, so they said something about hauling for the title. And, and, uh, and it was a, lot of, a, long, a long road. Learned a little bit about keeping a horse going. Learned a lot about what and not. It came to do. down to Oklahoma City. Yeah, it was a hot, it was a hotly contested title. <laughs> huh. That's you saying that. Uh, you know, between me and Scott, your brother, huh? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and really, uh, we had two totally different kind of horses. He had a, either a four or five year old. Both sons of Hollywood Jack, but his horse was four or five and fresh and and a good horse, really good horse. Uh, you know, Scott. Was that Mega Jack? Mega Jack. Yeah. yeah. Scott came to uh, Lexington, Virginia, there in the Fourth of July, and uh, uh, his. I mean, that horse was uh, his was awesome. He kicked my ass for fun, and I can remember uh, being back in the stalls after it was over, and that horse. He had white or uh, pink skin. You know, he looked. He. It was hot, and he just. 
he'd had enough. And I decided right then and there that I was going to either, I was going to change, I was going to have to change my approach or I was going to quit showing him. And uh, I took that horse home. I gave him a couple of weeks off. I never rode him at my house after that. Never. Uh, I took him to, I took him to, I, I knew one thing. I didn't want to go where Scott was going. He went to Denver and all them big trophy reinings, and I went to Canada some. I went to the East Coast. I went to places where you could mark a 71 and win the <laughs> reining because uh, I knew that I couldn't keep doing that with that horse, basically putting schooling runs on him but putting money right. on yeah. him at the same time. And uh, uh horse just started to get better and better, and then and, uh, I was – Proud of him by Oklahoma City. He could, you know, I had him where he'd show good yeah. again. Huh. Marked a 223 on him and, and took the bridle off him in the arena. And I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, both huh. both of those were really great sons in Hollywood Jack. Really good, yeah. And that horse has to be recognized. I'm talking about Hollywood Jack uh, on the influence that he's had on our industry, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, those horses back then, even long before those two horses, they they stopped like we want them to stop today. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And your father-in-law had a, a lot to do with that because that horse, until the merger between Richie and Sally and that horse, <clears throat> that whole thing, uh, and Tim starting to get on those horses. Uh, Really, it was until then that they really had any recognition as being uh, open level horses, you know, really yeah. good horses. And it's kind of sad because it was kind of at the end of his breeding career. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the Jack Pack. Yeah. Put yeah. That, that was the whole deal. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that was the thing about Hollywood Jack that people don't remember is you could buy one and it was probably going to work. Yeah, he probably had the highest percentage of money earners of any stud in the reigning horse history. Yeah, hmm. you know, you, now it doesn't matter what stud it is. If you bred, if you breed ten mares, if two of them are are bona fide uh, level four open horses, you're extremely lucky. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you're extremely lucky. I mean, it just and and back in now. Granted, a bona fide, there was no level four. There was open and non-pro, and it had a lot more to do with, did you send it to Tim or BH or one of the top five guys back in the day? Because there was really only maybe eight or ten guys. That could train them. That could train them. And show them. You know, there were, those guys were so far ahead of everybody else. Now, I mean, you're seeing assistant trainers, that can go out and market 23, 24, 20. I mean, uh, uh, the business has changed. And, right. and all for the better. Right. All for the better because I feel like that's the one thing that has been, uh, if there's been any kind of thing that's kind of kept our growth down a little bit, is not enough horse trainers to service all the people that want to do this. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think it's, it's great that where there's more and more people that can train them. And, but back then it wasn't like that. You know, it was, there's, there was those maybe seven, eight, nine, ten guys that could do it. And, and, but the Hollywood Jacks were amazing. I mean, they, they could all do it. They all stopped. Yes. Mm -hmm. All of them. Everyone. They could have their hind legs hanging out a mile behind them and they would. Yeah. And when you talk it today, you're there looking at the yearling sale and you're looking at the thing and you want to, you want to good set to their hawk and a big hip and hind leg and the jacks weren't that no nope. you know they they were not built to stop like they did and they did anyway yeah mm -hmm. so yeah it was uh i had a lot of fun you know i went down to uh i've been to richie's one time and we went down to show in at kenny eppers's place i yep. went with scott down I didn't show, but I went down with Scott. He had a really good little mare that he took down there, and, and you know I was probably 17, 16, 17, and I was just—I mean, I was—you know—I was like a kid in a candy store. Right. You know, I mean, I was in awe of all that, 
and went over to Richie's and yeah. that uh, that Chicago area was a really a, a real hotbed for renting at that time. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And and you know I, I would say Ken was Kenny Eppers was the biggest part of it. Yep. And then really did a lot to promote rain yeah. in that area. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know, and coming behind Ken Butch Campbell. Yep. Um, you know, I remember the Minnesota State Fair would go on, and I mean, I'd I'd get ready, I'd get my draw sheet and a popcorn and a big Coke, and I'd sit there. I could not wait to watch because at that time, Ken Eppers would come, Butch Campbell would come, Bob Anthony would come, Bill Horn would come. I mean, that was before the Derby. This was when they just had a big open at right. the Minnesota State Fair. And it was, it was for a kid to watch. I mean, it was incredible. It was incredible. And I think, you know, sometimes we forget that there's kids out there today that have that same feeling. Oh, yeah. You know? And you, uh, you just always got to remember that and, and thank goodness for that. Because